Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Activities for People Living at Home with Dementia. We are proud to offer this series with funding from the Area Agency on Aging and the United Way of Tarrant County. These programs are recorded and are made available for viewing on a YouTube channel for future use. I am your host for today's activities. Our topic today is brought to you by our Heyman Carter Museum of American Art, Director of um, Manager of Outreach, is it Peggy? No, it's, uh, what am I? Manager of Access Programs and Resources. Okay. Access programs. Hey, if you want to call me a director, I'm going to let's get it printed. That's up right. We uh, we, we'll that's give you a promotion. Uh, and we'll give we'll you some extra promotion. money for that. Yes. Please. From your lips to bad ears, it's the facts now. There you go. And Peggy's going to talk about high contrast today. I can't wait to see what she's brought. Peggy, it's all yours. All right. Thank you for that, Martha, for the yes, promotion yes. and the introduction. I appreciate it. <laughs> the easiest promo we've ever given. Yeah, right. So I'm just going to send you to HR after this conversation. And okay. It all out for me. So today's high contrast, very vague, but um, it's a fancy term for black and white. So we have tons and tons and tons of artwork in our collection that's black and yeah. white. The same way abstract, we could do a million ah. sessions on abstract. We could do a million sessions on black and white. And there's a bunch of different ways to interpret black and white, whether it's photographs, or ink on paper or lithographs. So every medium has versions of black and white. And so we're looking at a few different mediums today and we're gonna start off with this. It's a painting, Oil on Canvas by Frederick Remington entitled The Right of the Road, A Hazardous Encounter on a Rocky Mountain Trail. So does this look like a painting to you? Yes. It does. What what aspects of this painting, Don, does it seem? I think I see. Uh, um, you know, it looks like the, the, the some of the some of the details, like the, the lines on the trail, or like like brush right marks, and uh, mm -hmm. it just has the feeling of, of a painting. Yeah, uh, yeah. You'll notice brush strokes on the back of the horse, the long strokes Don uh, pointed out on the on the trail. Even some of these strokes yeah, on, some of the, the on the side of the mountain there. Yeah, exactly. So this is a rather large painting. It's 40 inches by 27 inches. So it's deceiving um, on this screen, but it's rather a large painting in black and white. And we're, I'm going to give you a deep cut art history term. When an artist is painting in black and white, it's called grisaille. What is it? It's grisaille. And it's a French, it's G R A I. S-I-E-L-L-E, -E. I think that's how you spell it. Ooh. Don't quote me on it, guys. I'm not fancy. a speller. Rizai. Okay. Rizai. And so, or G-R-I-S-A-I-L-L-E. -L -L -E. So if you speak other languages, Gris, G-R-I-S, is off, it means gray. And mm -hmm. so it's, it's this style of painting in black and white. Oftentimes it's meant to represent something 3D. So it could be meant to look like a sculpture, a, you know, a marble sculpture, but it, this practice of painting in, in a monochromatic palette is called reside. And so here, this is a really good example of Frederick Remington doing that. And the reason, and this is a really good, um, good example of his ability to paint this way. He was an illustrator. That's how he cut his teeth. He was a well-known illustrator that was published in Harper's Magazine, um, different periodicals. And so he was really good at illustrating in black and white. And because of that, he got really good at condensing scenes using only, you know, really two colors, black and white, minimizing all of the other detail and getting it down to its essence, which here, it, there's not much he's depicting in detail, but you get the whole Scene. So can you tell me what you see here? What's happening in this scene? Looks like the horses are spooked. Horses yeah. are spooked. Guys riding a bicycle. Guys riding a bike. You can see what's here. Stagecoach. Stagecoach. Yes. Big one. Yeah, people in the stagecoach. Mm -hmm. and, and the driver at stagecoach is trying to control the horses. Yes, right here. Yeah. 
So you just gave so many different descriptors about what's happening and there's no color. There's not much to it. We don't know what time of day it is. We don't know even the time of year it is. But we know that these horses are spooked because there's a man on a bike. The bike probably freaked these horses out. We've got the, the person who is um, trying to rein in the horses. We've got two people. And when, then we even see they're just marks, but we can see that there are people in the stage. Yeah. We don't yeah. even see that, that it's a person, but we can tell by that the gray he is, <coughs> that there's people in there. So <clears throat> a lot of times he would do these black and white preparatory paintings to then illustrate but he was also a really good illustrator in black and white. So it's kind of like the chicken or the egg. He, he used, a lot of painters will practice something in paint, black and white before they illustrate. He was able to go back and forth to both. And as he got better in his painting, he was able to really use that to hone in on his illustration. So here we have this scene um, of these horses being spooked. Interestingly, when he um, created this, this painting, he had gotten a job through, I want to say, um, I wrote it down, Denver Rio. Yeah, the Denver Rio Grand Railroad <clears throat> to go and travel 300 miles along the Rocky Mountains to depict the West, the Wild West. And when he was, he was in New York prior to this, and he was really itching to get back out west, but there was nothing funding his project until he came across this, this railroad deal. And he was so disappointed on that trip because by 1900, the west was settled. It wasn't this wild west he had always, you know, we think of with Remington with the cowboys and the Indians and the, you know, these elaborate military scenes, that kind of stuff had really gone away or wasn't happening nearly the way that the Easterners thought the West was living. It was tamed. So while he was seeing a pretty um, industrialized, settled uh, West, he didn't depict any of that. And this bike is the most modern thing he's depicting on this entire trip. Mm -hmm. And he's depicting it in a negative way because he's showing this man on a bike and how it's completely spooking the way of the West. This is bothering me because what the hell's a, a man on a bike doing out on a stagecoach route? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I felt the same way, Don. Exactly. Just didn't belong there. Mm -hmm. it, it seems out of place. I mean, and think about how dangerous this would have been to be riding yeah. on a bike. If any of you have mountain biked, you know, it's loose gravel, it's dirt. And then you're right, trying to ride past, what is this? five horses and a massive stagecoach yeah. cheering on the edge of a mountain that's not on a road. I mean, it's on a dirt road, but it's not what we know for roads. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, Remington's way of saying like, we don't need these people on our roads. And people have hard opinions about bikers today still. And so yeah. this is, this is one of the, uh, <clears throat> earlier earlier depictions of you know share the road with a biker and and he was not impressed by it and he kind of captures that moment here the depiction the bicycle is, it shows that uh, the basic outline of a bicycle hasn't changed in over 100 years yeah because it's got the, the, the fork in the front and back and the chain and yeah. the and the, 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 the handlebars. handlebars and stuff and <clears throat> This to me seems like a really lightweight road bike given yeah. today's yeah. standards. It doesn't even seem, you know, think of the mountain bikes, how wide those tires are. I mean, he's literally, it looks like he's on a road bike tire. Oof, good luck to you, sir, riding in that kind of terrain. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're right. He captured, but this was really modern at the time, this bike. And it's still, you're right. It's the bones well, of what this bike looks like. I wonder if the day. tires were solid rubber because. Yeah. I don't think that they could stand up these long, long part of time if they were inflatable. Yeah, be, oh, that's a good point. be flat I don't know. quickly. And there's certainly just no gas bicycle stations. Experience. Certainly no gas stations, that's for dang sure. Yeah, yeah fill up a quick tire real quick at the 7-Eleven down, down the mountain. Yeah. <laughs> there, are, there are actually six horses in that. Six horses, yeah. 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 
Oh, you're right. Yeah, they're team their, plus. They're team together, three and three. And three. Yeah, this yeah. one seems kind of random, though, doesn't it? Because you can see these three are together, but then this one feels very far ahead of the, the two it would be attached to. Yeah. Hmm. Well, I, I think it's just the way the, 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 well, there's three in the back. I see two, and then this no. third one that's kind of random, but it doesn't seem to be syncing uh, up. I, I think I think the, the the one you're pointing at is just reacting to the two horses in front of him because yeah. they're they're rearing up, and so the, the third one is just rearing up behind him too. Yeah, it, it's two, two, and two. Yeah, yeah two, two, and two. two well, two, no, I don't two, know because two, two. there's yeah. In my mind, there's three horses in the back. I see three heads. Right. One, two, and three in the back. I see one, two. Now there's three. There's another third one. There's a, the light colored <laughs> one, and then one to the right is a head. Right Not here? To the left. No, the other side. Right there. Now down, down, right, go close, go. I'm sorry. I pointed with my finger. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, right right there is another horse right you can see the head right i i think okay so that I'm, I'm trying to use my fingers too there's two closest to the oh. right to the man with the reins this is one he's looking at us too he's rearing kind of peeling to the side i think i think with janine you said they're two two and two then we've got a horse here that you can't see any of its trappings you see, they, back, you see his back. You see his back. Oh, here we go. Tools. Yeah. You can see his body here. He's paired with the one who's looking at the rider, and then these two are seem to be in the front, and they're both uh, bucking. And the back, the two in the middle, seem to almost be catching up to the horses that have stopped running. Probably a really freaky scene if you're the man on the bike. Yeah, you're no trying kidding. to gain control of. Your wagon. Yeah. And look, look at this edge. I mean, it's not going to end well if he doesn't get no. control. <laughs> you know, so there's it, a it, lot. Oh, go ahead, John. I thought at first I thought it was the horses passing the bicycle, but it, it's obviously the bicycles passing okay. on a down slope, passing the horses. Mm -hmm. Ooh, that gives me the heebie-jeebies just thinking about it flying down a mountain like that on a bike. Mm -hmm. I do like the uh, shadowing that you see. Right here. Yeah, and even off, off the bike. Yes. Yeah, <laughs> you know where this, the, the light is coming from. And you can even see it on their their hair, the horse's um, body. That, that highlighting he's using for the sun hitting that side. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so I mean, again, we know Remington is just as great as everyone makes him out to be, and this is no ex no anomaly. He did a really okay. wonderful job telling us a story in just black and white, and he picked up on shadows and the details of their faces. I mean, it's just a really remarkable piece of art. So we're going to leave our friend Remington on the mountainside, and we're going to head back into the city, and we're going to be in New York City now. <laughs> Cute. Isn't this sweet? Yes. So tell me what you see here. <laughs> Halloween. Say that Halloween. again. Halloween. That's what I'm thinking with. Yeah, no, you're exactly just... right. It, it is Halloween. Oh, I was going to say young bank robbers. <laughs> <laughs> it, it looked like oh, the Green Lantern. Yeah. The Green Lantern. <laughs> yeah. I was going to say a, mac, uh, a masquerade ball. A ball? Ooh. A baby ball? Mm-hmm. Oh. This is actually Halloween. Martha, you got it right on the right out of the gate first guess. This is Halloween. And when I first saw it, I did not think Halloween at all. I just thought kids playing dress up. But this is Halloween. And it's it's right out on someone's front stoop in the city. I mean, this feels very urban, very urban childhood. Um in a tenement house to be more specific it's in tenement housing the photographer was a jewish immigrant from europe and um her her mo was taking street photographs of street scenes in her community 
particularly, you know, lower income housing like tenement houses. And so, and she was really in, interested in children. And here is, it's just a sweet moment, no adults around. So I'm sure some of you have that memory of whether you grew up in a city or in a suburban area or even on a farm, those memories of like, well, my parents aren't here and we can kind of do whatever we want, but I don't even know what we want to do with that. Right. <laughs> we want to be bad, but how do we do it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and so they're just standing on the front stoop. I mean, like we, we could go anywhere, but we're going to just stay on our front stoop. And so it, oh. it's, it's a, relating, a relatable situation for, you know, most people. And also it could have been we're home and, and our parents are either not back from work or our parents are inside getting dinner ready. I mean, their clothes aren't the cleanest clothes. You can kind of tell her socks or seem maybe like they've lost their elastic Good. or the bottom yeah, but, of his jacket seems a little tattered and dirty. But he's wearing a tie. Yeah. He is wearing, is it a tie? I can't tell. Yeah, it it's might a tie. Be, I can't tell. It's a tie, yeah. Both boys have a tie. Well, he's but the little girl, rem little girl reminds me of my daughter who hated something, didn't like bows in her hair, didn't uh -huh. like hats in it, didn't want anything on her face, you know, and she's trying to hold this mask off her face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're right. Like, I'll pose, but I don't want to wear it. Yeah, I don't want to wear it. Yeah. And that's great, Steve. Yeah, uh, that is great. I know. It's the, or even like think of Halloween, specifically Halloween, dressing your kids up and like masks would never stay on or certain hats. I mean, until they got to a certain age, I'm sure there was like, I don't want anything on my face. Because it, it looked like there's a hat on the ground. It's almost like yeah. she threw off a hat. Yeah. Because you know, it matches her dress. He's taking her mask off. Uh -huh. So I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this, you know, type of thing. Right. Oh, so reminiscent. I'm sorry. No, I love it. This is it's, exactly what I just, this picture is actually on view right now. It's really a beautiful photograph, but there's something just so relatable to this picture and so nostalgic, even just their sweet little clothing like that, that felt coat that she's wearing or wool mm -hmm. coat she's wearing. I mean, if your kids didn't wear it, you probably have pictures or memories of you wearing a coat like that, all dressed up. But um, this particular photographer, her name's Helen Levitt, and I said she was really interested in capturing these street scenes, these just kind of fleeting daily moments that people can relate to regardless of their, their background. And um, there, there's a palpability to this. I mean, you can almost picture yourself walking down the street and just looking and seeing somebody on their, their front steps like this, especially in New York City, everybody, but just the different vignettes you're seeing within that street and so it's her pictures have show a lot of freedom here there's a lot of freedom there, there's chaos she sometimes captures the coolest cruelty of children in games that she happened to stumble upon and the camera she was using was pretty small and the way it was is that she didn't necessarily have to be facing them the way that the lens worked she could be you know, her back could a little bit be to it. And the way that the camp angles of the camera worked, she was able to kind of photograph behind her. So she, there was no posing or staging of these photographs. Um, she just was really good at framing a scene. And, and here, there's nothing staged about this. She just happened upon it. And it, it just feels balanced. It tells a sweet story. And we know nothing about these people, but we kind of, you know, Steve was already figuring out what that girl's little personality was. And I get the sense he might be the older brother. I don't know why I think that. Just he kind of seems like he's protective, looking out, kind of. Their, their, their shoes really uh, are different. The girl on the on the left, the boy on the right, have high top leather shoes. Looks mm -hmm. like the child in the middle has sandals on with socks. It looks like, yeah, it does. They, it is different shoes. He definitely has, or he or she definitely has socks on. It looks almost like those Mary Jane like, strap, yeah. Yeah. strap shoes, which I'm sure they probably were hand-me-downs from a Yeah, because look at the toes on all of them are, are very worn. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yes. Exactly. I love the artistry of the banister. 
Yeah. Uh, yeah, the bric a brac on it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And the door behind it. Oh my yes. goodness. If you ever get a chance, there's a book out called Humans of New York. And it's a book full of pictures just of people in New York. Not nearly. I have an Instagram account too, and the fashion is what really sucks me in. Yes, yes. So you're right, Martha. This is a, this is the early one of the earlier versions of Humans of New York. I mean, mm -hmm. it it's just I could stare at this picture for so long because it's everything about it is just so appealing. So that's the kind of pictures I like to take is unstaged, just mm -hmm. capture the moments. <laughs> Um, everybody thinks I'm crazy because I don't well, have people pose for pictures. <laughs> look at the reflection in the glass. Oh, yeah. Good. What a nice point out, Myra. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The building shows the building across the street. Yeah. yeah. The window. And you can even start to see some of that architectural detailing that Martha yeah. was pointing yes. out. Yeah. So this is a lot of her pictures, um, Helen Levitt's pictures, are of New York street scenes. They're entitled New York. I mean, she's just really capturing the um, spontaneity of of city life. So we're gonna now we're gonna leave New York City. We're heading down south to Mexico. Ooh. And here we've got a totally different type. Oh, that's pretty. Yes, yeah, it? it's pretty. What what attracts you to this artwork, Steve? I think that was John. Oh, John, yeah. John, tell me, I'm sorry, John, tell me what attracted you to this artwork. Well, I don't know. It's sort of timeless looking to me <laughs> because I don't know. I've seen pictures like it mm -hmm. that were recently made, but this one somehow looks antique to me. Yeah, it's old. It was made in the 1930s and the style of um, the medium style is wood cut. So the artist was carving into wood and the places where you see black was not carved. The places where there is white, that's where the artist carved in. Because mm. uh. then when you, when you think about it, when you roll ink over it, all of the positive spaces would be getting the inks. And then when you press it on the paper, those white lines are created because there was no ink touching it. I remember doing the same thing as a kid with tiles. Yeah, yeah, it's exactly. Same uh, tile lino cutting. Or linographs are the same yeah, type of thing. Yeah, the same, same type of thing. You cut it out and then you put ink on it and put it on the paper. And yeah. The so it's a paper. very um, old practice of art. It's a very traditional yeah, practice of art. Um, but you can capture, it's very graphic. He's a very graphic artist. It's very linear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the part I like. It's a bunch of lines. A bunch of lines. <laughs> Go, Janine. And it's a very balanced bunch of lines. It doesn't feel chaotic. It feels very deliberate and peaceful. And so I think part of what John was saying with the timelessness is true. We don't know who any, they're faceless people. So, you know, if you've been to any, any type of street market, this is going on forever and ever and ever and ever, yeah. ever. in yeah. Europe or you know in, in Central America. Street markets exist forever and forever. And so these, while you know, these are probably specific people he saw, he does not identify anybody's face. So it can be whoever it is to you, whether you know this was 50 years ago or now. And so these black, the, the women are wearing shawls, you can see the black scarves which might suggest it's probably really sunny outside with protecting their face. And this here is the woman's shawl is not over her head. You can see her hair. And then you see beautiful baskets. And I've not been able to find what the artist has depicted selling, but any guesses if this is Mexico, any guesses what that might be? Papayas. Papayas or Papayas. Or bread. Papayas or bread, yeah. And then you can see a man here, again, no face, but wearing very traditional um, peasant type of garb where it's probably a loose fitting white shirt, loose fitting pants. He's got them cuffed up. 
Bye, Steve. Bye-bye. We'll Bye, see you tomorrow, Steve. folks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks for stopping in. Uh-huh. So, yeah, so this particular artist, um, he, is, he was a brainiac. Well, he went to all the right schools. He went to Harvard for undergraduate, went to MIT for some architectural learning, and then went back um, to Yale for more drawing. Oh, my so gosh. Yeah. Pretty well-educated man. And then... Um, moved down to New York and was working with a bunch of artists through the, the Artists League in New York City that were very well known, or ended up being very well known. And after he got out of school at, at the Artists League, he went down uh, for a summer in Mexico and he was really, really inspired by what he called the exotic lifestyle of the street markets, which is very different than a New York street market. And, um, and he, became friendly with Diego Rivera, the, the muralist uh, in Mexico City. And so they had a, a rapport during his time there. So Diego was very inspired by the Mexican lifestyle as well. So there's some of that um, inspiration reflected here too. So pretty cool artwork. We've got, I think one more. And then uh, Janine, I was thinking of you when I pulled this one. There's almost nothing about this artwork, but I know you like abstract. So I thought we got to throw in a black and white abstract, totally abstract. <laughs> and it's untitled. So we have no idea what the artist was trying to tell us. Sometimes it, those titles can give us a clue. Yeah. But what, what do you, do you like this, Janine? Is this, this not your style of abstract or are you, are you feeling it? I like it. Oh, I don't love it, but I like it. Yeah. I, I don't like that it's contained. Okay. Like the, the, it doesn't go to the edge of the paper. Okay. That's the part that I don't like. Yeah. But on the other hand, I think that is a major part of what they're trying to depict. Mm -hmm. um, what year was this done? 1966. Oh my. It looked, it looks like a child seat to me or a, a cradle or a manger or oh, something. Okay, yeah, this is a fun game. What do you see when you first saw this? What is the first thing you saw? So we got a, like a bassinet cradle. Martha, what do you see? Uh, at first glance, I thought it was a, a face. Okay, a face. Myra, like what do you see? I thought it was the back of a head and they've got on earmuffs. Yeah. <laughs> I love oh. That. Okay, Don, what do you see? Uh, I see lines and stuff. Just, just see He's an engineer. He sees uh -huh. lines. <laughs> As we always need someone to, to humble us, to keep us straight <laughs> in what we see. Don, you just brought us right back to reality. I love it. Uh -huh. And John, what do you see? What do you oh, see when I you don't see? know. When you first looked at it, what did you think it was? I thought... What the heck is that? <laughs> <laughs> you're right. Yeah, they you're right. Reality. And I saw the top, the back of a turtle. I saw a turtle shell when I saw oh, it. Okay. Oh, oh, nice. So <coughs> this has been our own version of what are they called? Bore shocks. We're just yes. Yes. there's yes. nothing, yes. nothing scientific about what I'm saying. So you have to do your own analysis on what that means about you. But we did Don. We did assemble Don's mind, and we know that. <laughs> <laughs> And when you okay, we were look. looking at the line, the the uh, wood carving thing before, mm -hmm. and how straight those lines were and everything. When you told me he went to Harvard and MIT and yes. Yale, I'm like, yep, that's <clears throat> that that very precise yes. parallel and he, lines and, and all of that comes. So, so Peggy, how big is this picture that you're showing? This right one? Now? No, the other one. That one oh. is. Let me find my. It's pretty small. It's five by 10 inches. Oh, wow. oh, really steady hand. Really steady hand. Yeah, and he, um, when he was at MIT, his focus there was on architecture. Architecture so, and draft. Yeah. He, yes. the you, draft. Don't want a crooked, you don't want a crooked house, so he didn't have those. No, right. Yeah. yeah. And here, this is larger. This is, um, I want to say 13. Yeah, 13 by 13 inches. And he was... Um, this is part of that, that tamarind lithography workshop. We've, we've seen several artists come through this workshop that's produced. And um, it, the, the tamarind, as a reminder, was a, a work a, a studio where established artists who were not lithographers 
were invited to create for between four and six weeks lithographs because it was a totally different medium than they were used to working in. And this was a medium that often is dismissed as not higher art, but it is a very, this workshop was trying to elevate that style mm. of art. And so lithography is actually pretty work intensive. Um, you have people who print it for you, printers who are really good at lining up registers and things like that. But uh, Don, I, you know, it was really hard finding anything about this particular artist. And he, he was an intaglio um, etcher line drawer. So you can see, knowing, knowing that that was his background, these tiny hash lines. Yeah. 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 It, I mean, granted, he, so he's working on paper or metal. I mean, so he's used to working maybe a similar um, method of lithography. You can see he translated his ability to, you know, etch very tiny, short lines. You can see the, that carryover into his lithography. And those broad lines are almost impossible to achieve when you're doing intaglio. So that probably felt very freeing to him. But like Janine was saying, too much freedom. So he had to contain everything, you know, and keep it, yeah. keep it so your eye is staying within this, this oval versus following the lines off of the paper. It could okay. also be a thumbprint. A thumb, oh, that's a, a good one. Yeah. I can yeah. see a thumbprint, yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so Peggy, so this was a, a lithograph that was engraved in stone or metal or something? Stone, and, they're carving on stone. stone. And then this, this is all black ink? Yes, this, this he's using all black ink. You are able to print um, lithog lithographs in different colors, but yeah. it's, a, it's a lot more work intensive because you have to switch the stone out. Yeah. To, and then you have to clean the stone with all the different colors and line back up on a register. Yeah. yeah. So um, this this black and white, often lithographs are typically, or not typically, but you very commonly see it in black and white because it's a little less work intensive. All right, so those are our black and white high contrast photo, uh, images for today. Okay. I'm impressed. Yeah, there, it was, there, you can go so many different ways. You can go traditional with black and white. You can go totally abstract as you saw. So we'll, we'll do another high contrast later and hit. Okay. Diversity. I, you said it, Myra. Um, Next week is seafood. Seafood. We are, we are in the throes of summer and we are ready for seafood. Oh, seafood. So um, join us next week to get hungry. And then we'll yeah. Seafood <laughs> is my, kind of, my favorite kind of food. I see it and I eat it. Hey. <laughs> I haven't heard that one in a long time. I know. <laughs> yeah. That, that's right, y'all. Diet. Bye, Peggy. Have Bye, a wonderful day. Thank you, day. Peggy. <laughs> Have a wonderful day. Well, let's take a look at what's coming up. Fort Worth Museum of Science and History tomorrow. I do not know the topic, so it's going to be a surprise. Oh, I wonder if she's going to do guns, because we talked about that last time. Oh, I hope that's so. That would be interesting, since that's part of what's going on in our normal uh, uh, culture today. Yeah. It's talking about guns. And I know Don would appreciate that. Yeah. Sure. Because she, she said she can't do that, you know, with the high school or, you know, the, the kids that tour and she could do that with, with us. Great memory, Myra. Thank you so much for that. I hope that's what she does. I do too. I do too. Um, it is of the hour and uh, last week, we did not have Fifth Street Cafe because everybody had something to do. Right. Do y'all want to hang out and do Fifth Street Cafe or do you want to call it a day since we have two families left? Oh, well, the talking is the best part of Wednesdays. Yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Well, let me stop well, the recording.